This video is brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com slash halocanon for a 30-day free trial and a free credit on an audiobook download. Stay tuned for more details. Welcome back, Canonites. It's been a while since we've had a big, juicy cannon fodder article to sink our teeth into, and boy is this one juicy, covering just about every topic one could hope for when it comes to Halo Fireteam Raven. If there's any shortcoming, it's that I just, I still want more. But what's here is more than I could have hoped for, so let's dive right in. Cannon fodder opens with a link to a behind-the-scenes video about the making of Fireteam Raven. Behind-the-scenes videos are always great, and this one is no exception, so do check it out. Moving forward, we get what could definitely be considered the highlight of this article, a complete timeline of events for the Battle of Installation 04, covering Halo CE, Halo the Flood, and Halo Fireteam Raven. I cover this in some detail in my review of Fireteam Raven, links to which I will leave in a card at the top right corner of this video, and in the description box. And of course, check out the Cannon Fodder article to read it through for yourself. I hope you'll forgive me for glossing over the timeline there, as I really want to get into what I think is the more important part of this article, Fireteam Raven's character profiles. As new characters introduced in an on-rails arcade shooter, there wasn't much room for character development or backgrounds to be explored in-game. While I hope we can get more about Fireteam Raven in the future, this is a great start. First up, we have Ethan Graves, commander of Fireteam Raven. A native of the Jovian Habitat cluster on Io, Ethan Graves grew up with fond childhood memories of his storytelling father, who spoke of Jupiter as the true unsung protector of humanity. Without her gravitational influence on wayward asteroids, comets, and other natural incursions, Earth would have likely been destroyed from without long ago. Ethan joined the UNSC Marine Corps as much to get away from a life working the factories and mines as to fight the insurrection, but his sharp intellect and decisiveness made him a natural leader. He rose quickly through the ranks, always leading from the front, earning him the admiration of his officers and the respect of his squad members. When the Covenant attacked, Graves immediately requested admission to the ODSTs. He knew now, more than ever, Earth was under threat from beyond and it was his Jovian duty to defend her. There's a kind of beautiful poetry that Graves would personally feel he needs to play a role defending Earth from the Covenant, in his own way doing what Jupiter had been doing for billions of years. Next up is Ava Lang, the explosives and demolitions expert of Raven. Ava Lang grew up around technology, spending much of her free time tinkering with projects brought home by her mother, a leading engineer for Acheron Security in the Chicago Industrial Zone. Her work on projects for the Tactical Autonomous Robotic Defense System eventually inspired Ava herself to study new semi-automatic solutions for explosive ordnance disposal. When she eventually enlisted in the UNSC, her skill set expanded to include the employment of explosive ordnance in more offensive capacities. Her deft decision-making and unflappable resolve eventually landed her a spot in the ODST ranks, where she was soon assigned to Fireteam Raven. So, there's a cool and somewhat obscure Easter egg here in Ava's backstory. Ava was born and raised in the Greater Chicago Industrial Zone, an urban sprawl that by the 25th century encompassed much of the former states of Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Incidentally, Sergeant Johnson was from Chicago, too. Ava's mother worked for Acheron Security on the Tactical Autonomous Robotic Defense System, or TARDS, which were tested in Industrial Zone 8, aka the Halo 2 Multiplayer Map Foundation. It's a pretty nice reference, if you ask me. Moving on, we have Marcus Hudson, Raven's Recon and Communications Specialist. Marcus was barely school age when first contact between the Covenant and humanity occurred. As the years rolled on, he was surrounded by a new Alexandria population, steeped in a false sense of security that the Covenant attacks that appeared with greater frequency on the news feeds could never happen to them. Marcus himself wasn't so sure and dedicated himself to being prepared in case the seemingly unthinkable happened. A gifted student-athlete, Marcus excelled both on the field and off, matching championship performances with academic accolades, a combination that put him firmly in the sights of top-level accelerated enlistment programs within the UNSC. His deft skills with a rifle were equal to his prowess with cutting-edge military technology, making him a natural fit among the ODSTs in Operation Red Flag. 
And we finally get our first mention of Operation Red Flag, which all of the UNSC personnel on Pillar of Autumn would have been participating in had the operation gone forward. And seeing as Marcus was from Reach, I'm rather disappointed that there weren't any references to that in-game. It would have been cool for Raven to have some in-game dialogue or banter that referenced things like Reach's very recent downfall. And now we come to our final member of Fireteam Raven, Victor Ramos, the Weapons and Support Specialist. Born in Casbah City on the colony world of Tribute, Victor Ramos grew up in a neighborhood that still bore the scars of insurrectionist terrorist attacks from nearly a decade before. From the time he was a child, however, family fears of another colonist uprising had turned into an existential dread of Covenant invasion. Ramos enlisted in the UNSC the moment he could, determined to give his loved ones, and many others like them, a reason to never be afraid again. However, as Ramos and his fellow Helljumpers were forced to watch Reach fall in 2552, he was forced to confront the knowledge that the Covenant were also raising his homeworld at the same time, and that there was nothing he could do about it. When the Pillar of Autumn jumped to Alpha Halo, he was left to ponder the fate of his family back on Tribute and promised himself he'd make it back as soon as he could. Tribute was a world in the same star system as Reach, though it was never the military powerhouse Reach was. But like Reach, it suffered from the Covenant's wrath in August of 2552. Once again, I wish we could have had some in-game dialogue for Raven to hint at this backstory. That last line in his bio would have especially made the ending of Fireteam Raven all the more tragic. Hell, next time I play Fireteam Raven or Halo CE, I'm gonna have it in the back of my mind that Ramos gave up going home to get the Master Chief that chance to stop the Flood. Holy hell, man. On a lighter note, it's kind of funny that between the members of Raven, we have two members from the human home system of Soul and two from Epsilon Eridani, and among each group, each have a member from a generally more important world, Lang being from Earth and Hudson from Reach, while the others are from often overlooked worlds, the Jovian Habitats for Graves and Tribute for Ramos. But anyway, that is Fireteam Raven, at least for now. I would love if we could get some sort of short story about a mission pre-Halo CE, allowing 343 to dive a bit more into each character, their specialties, and more. I'm always up for more Halo anthology books, and I'd love an author to take a crack at Raven someday. If not that, maybe something like a three-part comic? Moving on, we have two more character profiles, starting with Major Antonio Silva. Major Antonio Silva commanded the Pillar of Autumn's ODST forces during the conflict on Alpha Halo in September 2552. Decades earlier, while serving aboard the UNSC Atlas, four ODSTs under Silva's command were conscripted to play an unwilling part in a plan to test the capabilities of a then-young and freshly augmented John 117, a confrontation that cost two of the Helljumpers their lives. Furious at a seemingly wasted expense of his soldiers' lives, Silva would harbor a bitter grudge against Spartans and cling to these old hatreds until the very end. Still, with their backs against the wall after the Autumn's arrival and subsequent grounding on the surface of the Ring, Silva was instrumental in rallying the surviving UNSC forces against both the Covenant and Flood forces at Alpha Base, assuming command following the abduction of Captain Keys at the hands of the Covenant. In the end, however, it would be a misplaced sense of priority that would be Silva's downfall, as he sought to capitalize on the capture of the truth and reconciliation for gain and glory. In an attempt to commandeer the Covenant cruiser and return with it to Earth, ODST's commanding officer showed little regard for the Cole Protocol, potentially putting millions more lives at risk. Only a heroic sacrifice by his executive officer, First Lieutenant Melissa McKay, thwarted his misguided plans at the cost of the entire boarding party's lives, including her own. And last, we have the AI Wellesley. A fourth-generation Class C military dumb AI, Wellesley was designed to specialize in battle net management and control of automated weapon systems. Programmed with a quirky personality modeled on the historical Duke of Wellington, his holographic avatar reflects that of a stern-looking man with longish hair, a prominent nose, and a high-collar coat. Wellesley was assigned to the ODST battalion aboard the Pillar of Autumn. Though he was a good deal less capable than a top-level smart AI such as Cortana, all of Wellesley's computational capabilities were focused on military matters, making him extremely useful for managing battlefield logistics. With Wellesley hardware bound, typically housed in the command drop pod, Raven utilized a mobile command module as a relay link to allow real-time intel and comms with the AI's safely stored personality matrix. 
This allowed the ODST squad to react swiftly to the most updated intel available, aiding them greatly in their quest to assist the Master Chief. Though these profiles summarize both characters pretty well, if you want to learn more, pick up Halo The Flood. While primarily a novelization of Halo CE, it dives into much greater detail, including the Covenant perspective as a Sangheili named Zuka Zamami hunts the Master Chief across the Halo ring. It's an often overlooked piece of media, even in the lore community, but it seems like people are starting to appreciate it more these days. It may not be the best Halo novel out there, but it's good in its own right and I encourage you to check it out. If you're interested, you can pick up the audiobook version from Audible. By going to audibletrial.com slash halocanon, you'll get a 30-day free trial for Audible along with a credit for a free audiobook download. Every Halo book is available on there, so if the flood isn't your fancy, there are plenty of others to choose from. Moving on, the article covers some of the other canon oddities that appear in Halo Fireteam Raven. First up is the Lich, which makes a brief appearance during the third level, the attack on Alpha Base. Liches saw limited use during the Human Covenant War, and their deployment often left any UNSC forces devastated. As such, the vehicle wasn't officially documented until 2556, as the greater need for dropships in the post-war era meant more Liches seeing deployment. The Lich that appears in Fireteam Raven is called Upright Chalice, and was deployed from the Covenant destroyer Blameless Conceit. The destroyer was commanded by the shipmaster Ornoth Fulsimi. Blameless Conceit and Orna Fulsimi both appear in Halo the Flood. The next two sections deal with the Flood, notably the Pure Forms and the Juggernaut. Starting with the Pure Forms, as the Flood consume and convert everything in their path, the lack of potential hosts soon limits its ability to create new infected. However, with the conversion of the environment and the existence of a centralized intelligence, the Flood can spontaneously generate new war forms entirely from Flood supercells and salvage skeletons. The variety of forms these creatures take is vast and nearly impossible to effectively catalog, particularly as many can change to another configuration in response to new threats. The pure forms that appear in Fireteam Raven are more than likely pure forms that had been stored since the Forerunner Flood War and released when the Flood broke free on Installation 04. On the multiplayer map called Storage from Halo 3, which was set on Installation 05, we can see a pure form in Storage. It's not unreasonable to imagine that Installation 04 had stored away pure forms as well. The bigger issue with the Flood's presence is the Juggernaut, a command form. Juggernauts are highly specialized combat forms directed by a seething mass of infection forms linked to multiple hosts. The creature harnesses the host's minds to analyze enemy activity and adjust the local Flood strategy accordingly. They have some of the traits associated with fully-fledged key mines, including the ability to synchronize nearby parasites and relay information between distant Flood hordes. The most significant aspect of the Juggernaut is their enormous size and raw physical strength, capable of impaling armored vehicles with their sharpened tendril arms and crush unsuspecting victims with their trunk-like legs. I had theorized in my Fireteam Raven review that the Juggernaut would be something akin to a proto-key mine, and cannon fodder seems to confirm just that. They are command forms born from a number of infected hosts, giving rise to a simple intelligence that can coordinate nearby Flood. I can also imagine that the formation of such forms might be key to the Flood transitioning from feral to coordinated, and their organized efforts to gather biomass for the eventual formation of a grave mind. And that just about wraps up the article. It comes to a close with a number of links to Waypoint Universe articles relevant to ODSTs and the Battle of Installation 04. Even the most well-versed lore nerd can find value in these articles if you've never read them before, so do check them out. Finally, we have an excerpt from the upcoming Halo novel, Halo Silent Storm, A Master Chief Story by Troy Denning. This excerpt is read by Steve Downs and damn is it fantastic. I'll leave a direct link to it in the top right and in the description box. I really wish Mr. Downs had been tapped to read the entire book, given the focus on Master Chief. Halo Silent Storm releases on September 4th in physical, digital, and audiobook formats. And that wraps up this massive cannon fodder. Be sure to check out the full article if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this, be sure to check out Audible. By going to audibletrial.com slash halocanon, you can get a 30-day free trial and a free audiobook. Audible selection is unmatched and includes all the Halo novels. You can cancel at any time and keep any audiobooks you've purchased. So check out audibletrial.com slash halocanon today.